On behalf of the trustees and the staff of the volunteers of the Computer History Museum, I want to welcome you all here today. This is, believe it or not, the 28th year of our Fellows Awards. We started back in, thank you. We started back in 1987 by making Grace Hopper a fellow, and tonight we will bring the total number to 73. Our mission, as always, is the same. It's to make heroes out of technologists. The choice of who to give the award to each year is difficult, and I want to thank the mostly anonymous members of our Fellows Selection Committee, which varies from year to year and includes past fellows as well. And I also want to thank Cynthia Holiday of Upright Marketing. Thank you, Cynthia, for doing all of the logistics for the process, as she has for many, many years. We welcome the previously inducted fellows who are here tonight. It's always nice to have alumni here to welcome the freshman class. I'd also like to welcome some visitors we have here from one of the few other computing museums in the world. Dr. David Hartley and Kevin Murrell are here from the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park in England. Welcome. You know, in Silicon Valley, we enjoy some prominence these days in computing, but we do recognize that it was actually a Brit who invented the stored program computer. It was Charles Babbage. And it's wonderful see, to see that there's some increasing attention being paid to computing history in its ancestral home. As long as we're talking about ancient history, I'd like to transport you back, further back. Imagine, if you will, I feel like I'm channeling Rod Serling in Twilight Zone. Imagine, if you will, that it is 1815. This is an important year, as you no doubt will remember from high school. Napoleon is finally defeated in the Battle of Waterloo. The United States, a country of just 38 years old, is mopping up from its second successful war with Britain, the War of 1812. I'm happy to note for our UK visitors that relations between us have been rather better in the intervening years. The, the hot composer of the day is Ludwig von Beethoven, who is so far up to symphony number eight. The electric battery has just been invented by Alessandro Volta in Italy, but is, isn't practical enough to be used for anything. In New Orleans, in the United States, dental floss is invented. <laughs> Hey, look, somebody's got to do it, but it's not being used either. <laughs> what they didn't tell you in your high school history course was that also in 1815, two of the most unlikely people to contribute to computer history and the invention of the computer were born about a month apart. George Boole. George Boole was the son of a shoemaker and a maid. After elementary school, he went to a commercial trade school. He started work to support his family at the age of 16 when his father's business failed. Not a promising start, but he was a bright boy, and with his father's encouragement, he began to teach himself mathematics, and he blossomed. By his 20s, he was corresponding with famous mathematicians like Augustus de Morgan, and he was publishing papers in academic journals. At the age of 34, Without any college degrees, he was appointed to the chair of mathematics at what is now University College Cork in Ireland. So what does all of this have to do with computers? Although he didn't know it at the time, Boole invented the logic that all computers would later use. In 1854, he published a book titled An Investigation into the Laws of Thought, Laws of Thought, on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. In that book, he created a mathematical language for logic, which now, in his honor, we call Boolean algebra. Now, that was a great mathematical idea in the 1800s, but it took 80 years for someone to realize that it had practical engineering use. In 1937, Claude Shannon at MIT wrote what someone once called the most famous master's thesis of the century where he discovered what Boole had done and showed how Boolean algebra could be used to design the logical circuits that digital computers use. The Irish shoemaker's son defied the odds of his background and helped create the computing revolution. 
Also born in 1815 was Augusta Byron, whom we now know by an entirely different name, Ada Lovelace. She was the only legitimate son of the poet Lord Byron, who was disappointed, sorry, the only legitimate <laughs> child, the only legitimate child of the poet Lord Byron. I wonder if there's something subliminal that I was trying to transmit there. Byron was disappointed, however, that she wasn't a boy. Maybe that's what I was foreshadowing. <laughs> and he soon took off. He split from the family. Ada was a sickly girl, and she was privately tutored. But she developed a surprising interest in mathematics, which her mother encouraged because her mother thought it would prevent her daughter from developing what she saw as her father's insanity. <laughs> Something clicked for Lovelace. Like Boole, she blossomed. She became a mathematician at a time when women were simply not allowed to be mathematicians. Like Boole, she was tutored by the mathematician de Morgan, who once said she could become, quote, an original mathematical investigator, perhaps one of first-rate eminence. Lovelace met our aforementioned computer inventor, Charles Babbage, when she was 18 years old. That meeting changed her life and gave it purpose. She was fascinated by the calculating engines that Babbage was designing, and she became a groupie, a Babbage groupie. He was 25 years her senior, and he called her his enchantress of numbers. We, we don't know exactly every aspect of their personal relationship. Ada wasn't posting on Facebook very much. But we do know that when he invented the computer, she understood not only how it worked, but how important it was. She translated and extended a very long paper explaining how it worked. She worked closely with Babbage on what is probably the first computer program ever written the first software ever in the world. But even more remarkably, she saw something that Babbage didn't, that a computer might, and these are her words, act upon other things beside numbers. The engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. What Ada realized was that the computer is not just an automatic calculator, that it could also be a processor of symbols and ideas, which indeed it is now, 170 years later. This daughter of an insane poet was not only an enchantress, but also a prophet. If they were alive today, Lovelace and Boole would be made fellows of the museum, but we don't make posthumous awards, so instead we'll be celebrating the bicentennials of their birth this fall with a series of programs and exhibits. We're collaborating with University College Cork for Boole and with the Bodleian Library at Oxford for Lovelace. So stay tuned for the details of those celebrations in a few months. As far as we know, uh, Boole and Lovelace, these unlikely pioneers of computing who were born in the same year, never met. But what they had in common was that they defied the odds set by their backgrounds. They used just their natural talent and hard work to change the world. That's true of this year's inductees as well. We have the son of a hospital porter and a secretary with nothing more than middle school education. We have the son of a football coach. We have the daughter of Russian immigrants who didn't speak English when they arrived in New York and never went to school. Our fellows this year also defied the odds to change the world. This will be true in the future, too. At the museum, we have now an active and expanding education program aimed at encouraging students to consider computing as a career. We especially target girls and kids with backgrounds that wouldn't lead you to believe that they could be future fellows of the Computer History Museum. But they can be. If Buhl, Lovelate, Struestrup, Bachman, and Berezin can do it, so can they. All we have to do is encourage them. That's our role. Thank you.
That's the end of the history lesson for this evening, and now we get to enjoy making history ourselves and to move us in that direction. Please welcome the amazing CEO of the Computer History Museum, John Holler. Lynn, thank you so much. Uh, I just love that. It's so Lynn, first of all. You have to know that the chairman of the Computer History Museum is the living, breathing soul of this institution, and you got a big dose of it right there. And the other thing I would say is that the only pairing in computer history more notable than that of Boole and Lovelace is that of Lynn Shestek and Donna Dubinsky. <laughs> That was a wonderful explanation of what we do and why we're here, and Lynn's leadership has meant everything to that, and I can think you can see why that's the case. Now, you look great. You look amazing. The room is beautiful. You look beautiful. This is a sparkling night. We always want to make fellows a sparkling evening. Last year, if you were here, you know that I, I took a panorama and I tweeted it out to all of you, but that's so 2014. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> You know, Ellen did that. I'm, we're all over that. So I'm just going to meerkat a little bit here. Um, so make some happy noises, everybody. We are live streaming now. They're pouring in from all over the world. You are famous. Way to go. That's fantastic. I hope you will go on social media tonight. You know, you can post to Facebook. You can send your dinner to Instagram. You can meerkat your conversation. You can Snapchat the family back home. Uh, if you're following me, it's at JCHCHM. And if you tweet tonight, please use hashtag CHMFellows. Now, some database in the world somewhere knows that I'm at JCHCHM and that hashtag CHMFellows will get you tonight's Twitter stream. And as you heard from Lynn, that has everything to do with Charlie Bachman. And the fact that you can type into a little keyboard on your screen and a microprocessor will translate all of that to text that you can send to someone that goes all the way back to Evelyn Berezin. And I'll bet there's some C++ involved in some of that. <laughs> I'm not the technician and engineer that Lynn is, but I'm pretty sure C++ is involved, and Bjarni Strustrup is the man who's responsible for that. So that's what our fellows do. There have only been 71 of them in 27 years, and all of them, as Lynn said, have changed the world for the better. But let's have a show of hands. How many of you tonight had ever heard of Bjarne and Evelyn and Charlie before tonight? How many of you had heard in this crowd, you would expect a few hands to go up. But look how few hands there are, ladies and gentlemen. That's amazing. So we're out to change all that, and we think it's a real honor and a privilege and, in fact, a joy to be able to tell these stories and, in our own way, to help step-by-step step transform the world's understanding of our relationship with computing, its history, its impact, and the implications for the future. Now, there are a lot of people to thank for a night like this, and I'm going to get through this very quickly, but they are important people, and I do want to say thank you. A number of very generous individuals and companies have helped to make tonight possible, led by the headline sponsor, Accenture. We want to thank Accenture for their generosity in making the evening possible. Give it up for Accenture. Thank you. And a large number of patron sponsors who are now also appearing on the screen. Lynn thanked our board of trustees. We have 18 trustees here tonight. Year after year, I believe they prove they're one of the best nonprofit boards in the country. Uh, Lynn is certainly at the heart of that, and it's, uh, it's just a delight to serve with all of you and to have you be so, so supportive of the museum. I want to thank, as I do every year because their work is always amazing, Peggy Burke and 1185 Design and Michelle Hallam, who contributed the graphic design for this year's awards. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Valerie Alston and Karina Sweet make this place beautiful and make all the logistics run. John Plute produces all the media. You're going to see some wonderful films of the fellows in a bit. And John is, runs the show and produces those films and is our director of media. And Allegra is the AV team who brings it all together. So thanks to all of you. 
Lynn mentioned that we have several fellows here tonight, and I want to call them out by name because they are, like the fellows tonight, some of the most spectacular contributors to the history of computing. Don Chamberlain, Whit Diffie, Federico Fagin, Ed Feigenbaum, Don Knuth. Welcome back to all of you. And now the fun part. It's been quite a year at the museum since we last saw you at Fellows 2014, and I'm going to give it to you. It's the fastest three minutes in sports, ladies and gentlemen, and here it is. Fellows 2014 was the night we inducted Qualcomm founder Dr. Erwin Jacobs and semiconductor pioneer Lynn Conway and x86 microprocessor architect John Crawford. It's been a busy year in other ways, too. Our acclaimed speaker series, Revolutionaries, hosted another incredible group of guests. One of our 2013 fellows, Pixar CEO Ed Catmull, came back to discuss his must-read book on managing creative organizations, Creativity, Inc. Biotech pioneer Elizabeth Holmes talked about her revolutionary blood testing startup, Theranos. Best-selling author and historian Walter Isaacson, who is here with us tonight, Walter, welcome launched his brilliant new book here, The Innovators, How a Group of Inventors, Hackers, Geniuses, and Geeks Created the Digital Revolution. We took the show on the road for the first time to NPR in Washington, D.C. to talk to AOL founder Steve Case, and then we went to KQED in San Francisco to kick off our series on the future of news with NPR, Jarl Mohn, uh, NPR president Jarl Mohn and KQED president John Boland. We jumped to the future of auto racing with the all-electric and highly computerized Formula E circuit with CEO Alejandro Agag. We blew a lot of minds with a blend of music and technology with virtuoso cellist Philip Shepard. We had top tech luminaries, IBM chairman, president, and CEO Jenny Rometty standing here in our 1401 digital recreation lab. Google's Eric Schmidt and Jonathan Rosenberg were here with Yahoo CEO Marissa Meyer. We profiled the brilliant new Steve Jobs biography, Becoming Steve Jobs, with authors Brent Schlender and Rick Tetzelli, and President Obama's longtime strategist and staffer David Axelrod came for a talk, and he let us in on a little secret. This is a direct quote. Without the internet, there would be no President Obama, period. We got the band back together, something that rarely happens these days, to look back on 25 years of Photoshop, 25 years, if you can believe that, and last Friday, we celebrated 50 years. Last Sunday was the 50th anniversary of Gordon Moore's publication of his landmark paper setting forth Moore's Law, and these are his official biographers, Arnold Thackeray and David Brock. We entered the second year of our long-term partnership with Cisco to build their corporate archive and to take the personal stories of legends like John Morgridge and John Valentine. We expanded by adding two new centers to go deep in specific areas. First of all, and this is such a tribute to Lynn, we acquired a new $6 million building to house a new research center and a center for the research into software history, and that will be named for our chairman, Lynn Shustick. <laughs> our new center on entrepreneurship, headed by Marguerite Hancock, began a series of beta events in January, including a fascinating 360 evening examining the history and impact of startup companies like NetApp. We exhibited a brilliant photo essay all summer on the history of Silicon Valley called Fearless Genius, and we launched our new two-year exhibition on autonomous navigation called Where To. And our education team welcomed thousands of students from around the world in our design code build, talking to the future and get invested programs. And we learned that one of our get invested graduates from Monterey, Mexico, returned home to solve an important problem. He created a solution for the need for a blood type clearinghouse. So he created an app that would text you when the local blood bank ran low on your type and would tell doctors your blood type if you couldn't talk to them. And he sold it to a local medical foundation for a million dollars. In case you missed it, March 14, 2015 was Pi Day. It was 3.14.15, and at 9.26 a.m., we had 450 people waiting to get into the museum to our celebration. And this is the year of computing went Hollywood, and we went a little bit Hollywood, too. You can see with the theme tonight, uh, this is two of the wonderful people behind the imitation game. If you watch Downton Abbey, anyone watch, watch Downton Abbey? You'll recognize Tom, the chauffeur. 
Alan Leach, who played the Soviet double agent John Karen Cross, and Graham Moore, who just happened to win the Academy Award for screenwriting in front of our Enigma machine, which also appeared on the cover of Time Magazine's Genius Issue with the cover essay written by, yes, Walter Isaacson, and our machine was also inside on page 68. History never looks so good. <laughs> Evelyn, Charlie, and Bjarne uh, have been part of this history. We're so proud to have you be part of this community. You've been there for many years, and tonight we welcome you to it as the fellows of the class of 2015. We'll hear a great deal more about you tonight. It's a great privilege to honor you here. And now it's up to me simply to say, enjoy each other, enjoy your dinner, and the program will continue in just a while. Thank you very much. Good evening. It is truly an honor to be here tonight at the Computer History Museum. And Accenture is extremely proud to be the headline sponsor of tonight's 2015 Fellow Awards. As we all know, today, technology is all around us and is accelerating at an increasing pace. It is being created and used by people of all ages, walks of life, and from all over the world. Today, a teenager can write an app for their smartphone that they then sell for millions of dollars. Toddlers can tap away at a tablet. Cars drive themselves. Heart attacks can be predicted and prevented before they ever happen. Money is exchanged instantaneously, and even everlasting love can be discovered and cultivated through technology. <laughs> but how did this happen? How did technology and computing come to surround us all? In keeping with tonight's theme, if you went to Hollywood and asked a young star about their role models from the golden age of Hollywood, you might hear about a Humphrey Bogart or a Katherine Hepburn. And really, it's because we've all grown up through movies. But if you then ask that same question of that emerging teenage tech star, who are their role models from computing history, you'd be lucky if you got a Bill Gates or maybe a Steve Jobs. And you know, it's not because the history of computing is not nearly as exciting as that of Hollywood. We heard some great stories early this evening but rather it's really about access to the information. And that is exactly what the Computer History Museum is all about. The Computer History Museum is shining a spotlight on this very important history, and tonight is their Academy Awards. Please join us as we honor the past in order to inspire the future. Please welcome back to the stage the CEO of the Computer History Museum, John Holler. Michael, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks to Accenture. You know, you really nailed it in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, people are finding true love on the internet uh, all the time. <laughs> I mean true love, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and actually, there's a member of our staff here tonight who is with his new fiance, and they met on Match.com. So, <laughs> bravo. And you also, you also nailed it in another way, because this is kind of our Academy Awards, and, and, and Hollywood is our theme this year. You know, we started to call this year's fellow awards the Golden Nerdies, or something like that, to, uh, to make it a little more Hollywood-esque, uh, because Tinseltown has definitely come to computing history. We talked a little bit about this last year, if you were here, but this year, that little trickle we had has become a flood, because... Um, Hollywood is all over what we do now. It's become some of the most compelling stories ever. First of all, there are these guys. Yes, they're back. Are you watching it? Who's watching it? All right. For their second season. And when I saw this new poster, I kept wondering, hmm, where have I seen that before? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I never, I never figured it out. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, understand where they got that. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me at some point. And then there's this new ABC miniseries, The Bletchley Circle. Are you watching this? Anybody watching The Bletchley Circle? All right, so meet the women code breakers who worked with Alan Turing. 
to break the Nazi code, and now they're hunting down a serial killer, although they've disguised their work by telling their husbands they're in a book club. <laughs> so I feel compelled to warn you at this point, this plot may contain historical inaccuracies. <laughs> Ex Machina, anybody gonna go see Ex Machina? So here's Ex Machina. Explores the ethics of aug augmenting humans with robotics and artificial intelligence. Their star is a humanoid called Ava, meet Ava. People have asked me, what is Ava like? And I said, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, like a DNA graft involving Scarlett Johansson and Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> so look at that. I mean, that is, the special effects are pretty awesome. Now that is Hollywood running wild with Moore's Law. And, and now everyone is running wild with Moore's Law because you know about Moore's Law, but do you know about the domino effect. So the domino effect is the law that says the amount of cheese in the average pizza is gonna double now for about every two years. <laughs> but the big daddy of them all, and we talked about it a little bit earlier when it came to the merger of Hollywood and computer history was of course, the imitation game which told the story of Alan Turing and the breaking of the Nazi Enigma Code. That's right, give, give it up for Alan Turing. And our friends David and, Karen, and Kevin from uh, Bletchley Park know that story well. In fact, they, they retell it often. Uh, we here in Silicon Valley also felt the impact immediately because we had a really sharp increase in visitors coming to the front desk uh, saying, hey, where's that Cumberbatch exhibit? Now, the title of the imitation game, as you know, is drawn from the Turing test. Alan Turing wondered if a thinking machine could answer a question so well that the questioner would find the machine to be indistinguishable from a human. Now, thankfully for us, I think, so far, no computer has really successfully imitated a human being. But, of course, that's not surprising because many of us have relatives who can't successfully imitate a human being. <laughs> But machines are getting smarter, and so it's important that we keep them at bay. And if you decide to take a Turing test, I feel it's important you know how to win. So the Computer History Museum presents the, the top five statements that indicate you are talking to a machine. Number five, I may be a sophisticated calculator, but I never used my personal email for government business and deleted 30,000 messages. Your Blackberry might say that to you. Number four, I can't answer that right now. My girlfriend Siri just left me for Watson. <laughs> Number three, next time the Terminator wins, sucka. <laughs> Number two, I find the Computer History Museum to be an outstanding entertainment value. And the number one way you might know you're talking to a machine. This guy is one heartbeat away from the presidency and you're worried about artificial intelligence? <laughs> Fortunately, we have a building full of real intelligence tonight. Foremost among them are our fellows, Evelyn Berezin, Charlie Bachman and Bjarne Strostrup. And as Lynn said in his opening remarks, they really have changed the world. And we have a tradition now of seeing that our fellows induction ceremony spans the generations. The inductions of our fellows are now conducted each year by members of our Next Gen Advisory Board, a group of future history makers who help us connect the past to the future for young entrepreneurs, engineers, and founders throughout the valley. It's the generation whose leaders will start becoming fellows here about 2045. The spectrum of our next-gen community is represented by this year's presenters. Jeremiah Stone is the general manager of industrial data intelligence at GE Software. Alexia Sotsis is co-editor of TechCrunch. And Serge Grossman is a corporate development executive at Google. So to begin placing both history and the future proudly on display this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeremiah Stone.
Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's quite a privilege to be part of the Next Gen Advisory Council because we are you know, keenly aware that we're warming our hands at fires we didn't start, and we stand on the shoulders of giants. But for me tonight, that's particularly accurate. Our first honoree this evening is Charles Bachman. Bachman is known for his conception and development of the world's first database management system, IDS, the Integrated Data Store. Thanks to Bachman's passionate promotion of IDS in both business, technical, and other communities, IDS has had a major influence on the design and implementation of database systems for decades. It shipped two years before IBM had a competitive offering. Bachman served on the important ISO OSI Standards Committee from 1978 to 1982, and in 1983 founded Bachman Information Systems to develop a line of software engineering tools. No single person has done more to establish the basic principles of a database management system today as we, as we know it today than Charles Bachman. Tonight we honor Charles Bachman and present a short summary of his contributions to technology. I grew up in East Lansing, Michigan, which is in the heart of General Motors and Ford and Chrysler building automobiles. You thought engineers are people who design cars and things that go with them. And that's mainly mechanical engineering. And so that's what I did. When I started working for Dow Chemical, they assigned me to a job in the engineering department. And so when I arrived there, I ended up getting in several assignments, all which related to information systems. And I had this mixed kind of a background, both business and engineering. And he offered me a job in the finance department doing a real bona fide information system. And in those days, you solved problems using punch card equipment. So I started working with the people in the punch card department, and we had a punch card calculator that did six calculations a minute. With his understanding of engineering, data management, and cost accounting, Bachman became head of Dow's first computer department in 1957. I went, first of all, to New York City and uh, went to a one-week programming course there for the Univac. And shortly thereafter, I went to Poughkeepsie to the homestead where they had courses for people they're trying to teach. Bachman liked the IBM 709 and became active in SHARE, a group where users of IBM mainframe computers shared developments in programming languages, databases, and more. I became the first chairman of the Data Processing Committee of SHARE. Suddenly, Dow, under economic pressure, canceled its 709 order and cut Bachman's team by half. It was time to move on. At the same time, SHARE users were frustrated by the lack of integration in software systems. Entire programs had to be rewritten to accommodate simple changes. In 1960, Bachman joined GE's Integrated Systems Project to tackle this problem as chief architect and programmer of IDS, the integrated data store. So the project was a, to create a generic manufacturing control system. I had written the complete detailed description of what IDS was, how it worked, and I had rounded up a bunch of data processing managers in GE who we call friends of IDS to look over my shoulder and critique it as I went. We wanted to do something that a good programmer in the field could learn and become proficient in quickly. Initially, the plans were rejected. He said, well, this is all very nice, but I've got other things to do. I'm, I'm not going to continue the project. And fortunately, the low voltage switch gear general manager said, I'll put his hand up and said, I'll take it over. That general manager furnished his top systems people to help bring their knowledge into the project. It was designed to be a system that was adapted to many different targets, to many different applications. And it was not a one of a kind. And everything up to that point, it was a one-of-a-kind program at great cost. This versatile, revolutionary system enabled the visualization of a wide variety of data. In 1973, Bachman received the ACM Turing Award for his role in the creation of modern database management systems. 
and graphical data structure diagrams are known as Bachman diagrams. I don't think it was being work. I just think it's been, it's been exciting. Charles Bachman has influenced the industry for more than six decades. As the founder of Bachman Information Systems, the chairman of the ANSI and OSI committees that standardized the seven-layer OSI reference model, as well as serving on many other committees and boards. The 2015 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Charles Bachman tonight for his early work on developing database management systems. Accepting the award on his behalf is his daughter, Chandini Bachman. So Charlie's particularly going to love this design of um, the disk drives because the integrated data store was created right when the disk drive was on the horizon. And they knew it was coming, but it wasn't here yet. So um, it was created for the disk drive, and the integrated data store made the disk drive very useful. So he's going to love this design. Thank you so much. So Charlie's in uh, Lexington, Massachusetts these days. Um, he asked me to come and receive the award. And so I'll be reading the statement that he wrote. Um, so just imagine I'm 90 years old, OK? <laughs> so <laughs> he said, my induction today as a fellow of the Computer History Museum is the crowning award of my career in technology, which began during World War II in the US Army in the South Pacific. This award is something I never expected, and so I'm deeply grateful to the people who nominated me and voted um, for the recognition. My late wife, Connie, and I were active participants in this startup of the Computer Museum. We worked with Gwen and Gordon Bell on the deck phase and then the Boston waterfront phase. My role in the Computer Museum in Boston prior to its move here to Silicon Valley was as chairman of the executive committee for about a year during the move into Boston. As a boy growing up in Michigan making soapbox derby racers, I knew that all I wanted to do when I grew up was to build things. I wanted to be an engineer, and I wanted to make the world a better place. I am thankful for the opportunities that I have had to pioneer inventions and innovations that are foundational to our modern information and uh, economy and our modern information society. I'm very thankful for your recognition. It is important for me to credit my late wife, Connie, who was my partner in creativity, in business, and in life. There were many friends, family, and colleagues who helped along the way, and of course, I'd like to thank them all, especially to thank those at General Electric who gave me the creative opportunities to invent. I want to acknowledge my heartfelt appreciation to my GE colleagues, Stan Williams, Russ McGee, and Homer Carney. It is amazing how much faith General Electric had in our team with no guarantee of a useful result. And now I am passing the torch. I hope that young people just starting out can look at an honor like this and see all the new creative opportunities before them and the difference that those can make for the world. Again, thank you very much.
Good evening. Tonight we honor Evelyn Burzen, computer system designer and entrepreneur. Uh, this woman is so badass that during re rehearsal, when her movie was playing, I had to stop myself from going, you go, you go. <laughs> After two decades of designing and managing the design of specialized computers for industry, in 1969, Burzen founded her own company, Redactron, to build and sell word processing systems. Redactron's main product, called the Data Secretary, was groundbreaking in its use of custom integrated circuits. Anticipating the first commercial microprocessor introduced several years later. Burzen's company grew to over 500 employees when it was acquired by Burroughs. Burzen's passion and persistence led to brilliant success at a time when opportunities for women were very limited, even more limited than they are now. Tonight, we honor Evelyn Berezin and present a short summary of her contributions to technology. Evelyn Berezin was born to Russian immigrant parents who had no formal education. My older brother was seven years older than I was, and he got started buying astounding science stories. And he brought it home, and I started to read it. And I was fascinated by it. I thought it was marvelous. I used to steal them from him all the time. And, and, and it was really that, that that got me interested in this. I graduated from high school. I went into Hunter College. The problem was that Hunter was a girl's school, which meant they didn't care much about science. And I wanted to study physics. Then, I mean, I, from, from the time I read about it in Astounding Science. At 16, Berezin was hired to work at a research lab in Manhattan, while attending three different colleges at night to study physics. So I took all my mathematics at Brooklyn Polytech and all my physics and chemistry and so on at NYU and all my literature art at, at Hunter. And I, I, and I was, at that time, since Brooklyn Poly was an all-boys school, the only woman in the school. <laughs> and the only woman who had ever been in Brooklyn Poly. In need of a better paying job, Berezin visited a physics headhunter recommended by her academic advisor. He said there are no jobs in physics now, he said, because the Korean War was on. And I said, you know, have, have you heard of any jobs in computers? I have no idea why I said that. I have no idea of where I knew about computers. He said to me, you know, I never heard of computers, but this morning I got a, I got a, a, a phone call from somebody in Brooklyn who's looking for people for a computer company. This morning, and that's what happened. I went over to the computer company. It was called Electronic Computer Corporation. I had never heard of it. The guy who was the head of engineering, Gene Leonard, his name was, Eugene Leonard, he gave me a test of, to design a, a, a network. Mm -hmm. I designed the network, I gave it back to him, and I was hired. And I was hired as a logic designer, which they didn't have. There, and later at Teleregister, Berezin designed machines for everything from managing magazine subscriptions to racetrack betting. In 1962, she took on a daunting project, creating a passenger reservation system for United Airlines. This was going to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You could not have a failure. That system went onto all three machines so that the first machine would pick up a message and take it off immediately, the first one that got it, and if it was busy, the message would go to the second machine, and if that was busy, the message would go to the third machine. And if the first machine was out, all it did was go to the second machine. So you never knew I had to fix things, or I had to move things. I mean, it was automatically that this went one, two, three. And uh, he told me that it never went down in 11 years. They used it for 11 years and that it never went down. 
Berezin left Teleregister to accept an offer at the New York Stock Exchange, but was devastated when the offer was suddenly withdrawn. The board said that they could not hire me. And I said, what? Why? I mean, you know, at the time, I was probably one of the two people in the world who could design a machine for them. I mean, I, I, I was really just, you know, stunned. They said that you were a woman, you'd have to be on the stock market floor from time to time, and the language on the floor was not for a woman's ears. I just didn't know what to do. And I, I said, I went back to, to Digitronics. From the first day I went to work in the computer industry in 1951 to, by this time, towards the end of 1960s, I had the same job. And I'm looking up the next row up to vice president, and I knew damn well that I would never get that job. That that job was for a man, and I would never have that job. And my experience at the, at the, um, at the stock exchange had taught me that. So I, I did come to the conclusion that the only way out was to start a company. Frustrated, Berezin started Redactron with three friends from Digitronics. And we started to say, well, what are we gonna make? And so we actually didn't start sort of with an idea that somebody had and said, we want to take this public. We started with saying, we're going to start a company. What are we going to do? We thought about word processing. Now, I, I knew that IBM made a machine called the MTST, which was used, uh, had been used for some years uh, for, word, for what we now call word processing, but it was very limited. And that said to us, that's a hole there that we can use because if, there's, if they're going to sell machines, they'll probably sell word processes if they ever come into the market. And if they sell word processes of any kind, that it would be, uh, they would sell them and they'd be expensive. So this is a safe place to go. Her design included an emerging technology, a single chip microprocessor. Manufacturing began in 1971 and within a year, Redactron shipped over 1,000 units, grew from 10 to 500 employees, and went public. Burroughs Corporation soon acquired Redactron. In 1976, Business Week published a list of the top 100 business women, and Barrism was the sole president of a tech company. Demand grew for her to serve on boards of technology companies and academic foundations. Evelyn Berezin blazed a trail for women through labs and fabs, unafraid of being the first or the only. You see what I mean? The 2015 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Evelyn Berezin tonight for her early work in computer design and a lifetime of entrepreneurial activity. And I'm honored to present it to her. You know, I'm, you're, you're, I don't know what you're doing to me, but it's, <laughs> it's astonishing. And I thank you all. And I'm, you know, just astonished again that I, that I, that I'm here at all. It's been such a long time. Uh, you know, I listened to uh, some of the other people who talked about, the, uh, they were old, old, uh, um, discs of, of uh, people who had given talks here at these uh, at these times, and they were they were talking about the many people they they knew and all the things they had done and all the schools they had gone to about computers and all the 
the places that they taught about computers and so on. And, I, and when I looked at that, I thought, well, you know, it's very different to have started before all that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I thought, well, maybe, maybe what I should talk about is what it was like when there was essentially nothing. And um, I'll, t I'll tell you when this was. It was, uh, it, it, uh, Eckenbach, it was, a lot of you know this already, but I, I know there are some people who might not. Uh, Eckenbach um, delivered, well, they, they started a company, and they delivered a computer to General Electric. It, I think, it was uh, the, the first co really commercial computer that had uh, been built in 1949, that was the earliest one. And, um, and there's a, a, a great mathematician named John von Neumann, who really, uh, according to what most people say, have really, really developed a great many of the ideas that, uh, that were used in computers to make them computers. And um, von Neumann actually started a, 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 the design of a, and the, and the construction of a machine that uh, would include all of these. And he started this in 1946, right after the war. Actually, it was originally designed to help with the calculations that were needed for the, for the, um, uh, for that, that new, new device, the, uh, the hydrogen bomb. Uh, I maybe should have brought that up, but that was the reason. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, he finished that in 1953. It was, it was a very specialized machine, a wonderful one. Now, where I came in, and you heard this on um, this little, uh, this uh, uh, per performance I gave, <laughs> that uh, that was the interview that, that, uh, that the museum first came to me with, asked me to do that interview. And, um, and, and what I said in there, I talked about the, when I first got this first job, and I had absolutely no idea what computers were. I had been, I had an Atomic Energy Commission fellowship at the time, and this is in 1951, right? Before the 49 machine that had been built and the 53 machine that had been built. So right sort of about the first time machines were being built by anybody. <laughs> I got this job to design computers, and I walked into that place, and I had absolutely no idea what a computer was or how to design it at all. And there was nobody, uh, no, nothing around to use. I mean, there were no articles. There were no books. There were things in the minds of some people and I was lucky enough when I got this job in, in Brooklyn, two stops away from my house. <laughs> I, I, I cannot tell you how lucky I have been in all of this. It's just quite incredible. And, um, and I went and I uh, got there and I found that there were actually a couple of people who had come from Eckenbachley and had come join this company and really did know something about computers and within a very short time had, had told me what they were all about and I got the job of actually designing the whole computer, which uh, I was so ignorant and, uh, and maybe so arrogant <laughs> that it didn't occur to me that that would be hard to do. <laughs> Anyway, uh, there were very, I, the, there was a, there was a uh, I don't know whether it was an ACM meeting or one that happened before that, but I went to my first computer meeting of, of computer people in computers, and I think there were about 50 people there. Maybe, maybe, maybe 100. I don't think it was 100. So there were very few people in the industry at this very beginning, and then what we saw, we, we, new people, was starting with these klutzy, hot, enormous computers that all had tubes in them which didn't last 
any time at all. I think somebody told me that in the, one of the first things they started out with, they had a failure every two hours. <laughs> Not very easy to convince the military who's paying for all of this that it was a good idea, I thought. Anyway, we, we um, at, at that point, uh, they were all tubes and all very uh, strange instruments that we used for memory and so on, because none of these things existed. And so that started from there this whole kind of generation after generation of, of new ideas. And of course, the first one that was most important, I, I obviously, was, uh, uh, was, was um, uh, the semiconductors because they were just much more reliable, and, and, and memory, of course. Um, we, we were talking earlier, and then we went on from there to, to integrated circuits. And by that time, it was becoming clear that of the kind of things you could do were just growing. I mean, you were living in this, in this world that was sort of growing around you. And, and, and making it possible to do things every year that you couldn't do the year before. And it almost seemed as though, as time went on and these things became possible, it took a shorter and shorter time to get to the next one. It was almost like, uh, like the universe, you know, where the further out it goes, the faster it goes. And, and that's what we, we had in the whole industry of, of computer growth. So it's been a terribly exciting time to live through this, to start with the beginning of it and to go through things that, that are, were unimaginable at that time. And I'm very happy to have been involved with it and certainly very happy to you all to, to, to greet me as, as well as you have. I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Serge Grossman, and it is my honor to introduce our third fellow, Bjarni Schustrup. Upon completing his PhD in computer science from Cambridge University in 1979, Schustrup began work in the Computer Science Research Center at Bell Laboratories. While there, he invented the C++ programming language, now one of the most widely used languages in the world, for countless applications ranging from computer graphics, communications, embedded systems to massive scale e-commerce websites. Schustrup is, is, is our first third generation fellow. Both his supervisor, David Wheeler, and that person's supervisor, Maurice Wilkes, were CHM fellows. Tonight, we honor Bjarne Schustrup and present a short video of his contributions to computing. C++ succeeded, uh, not so much because I made a beautiful design, but because I was really lucky of having identified a problem that a lot of people were about to get. Bjarne Stostrup grew up in Aarhus, Denmark. With a talent for math, he decided to study computer science at the local college. The word computer is not in the title of that in Danish, so I was quite um, capable of misunderstanding it and thinking it was math. And in my second year I realized that I'd been wrong and uh, programming, uh, data structures, machine architectures is not math. Uh, at least not at that level. On the other hand, programming was, was really fun and learning about machines and computer science in general was, was really fun and uh, haven't looked back since. In grad school, Stostrup gained insight working as a contract programmer, dealing directly with clients. If I could build a demo that the 
a client was willing to pay for, then I got the job of implementing the system. And I, I have a, a fairly strong opinion about systems being appropriate and reliable and affordable, which I think partly came out of that. Stostrup earned a PhD at Cambridge, where his advisors included computer legends Morris Wilkes, Roger Needham, and David Wheeler. And you come in, you're a new grad student, you're full of great ideas, right? You come in and you're explaining these great ideas to, to David Wheeler. And he sits there and he sits thoughtfully. Yeah, yeah, Bjarne, that's not a bad idea. You know, we almost did that for the ETSAC 2, which was the most dreaded words, because that means that in about 56, uh, about the time I entered primary schools, they've thought of it. I wrote a simulator and I brought the university mainframe to its knees um, before I could get any decent data out of it. The resource demands of that simulator was just too much for, for the mainframe. But when you do this as a grad student, uh, you only do it about once before you're kicked off the machine because the astrophysicists and the chemists have much better uh, funding, financing, and political power. And I got my data and I got my PhD and I was, I came away with the opinion that I would never again want to attack a problem with tools that was fundamentally unsuitable. I don't want to make the choice between elegant, uh, which similar was for this problem, and efficient, which uh, BCPL was. I want both. And that has been sort of one of my guiding lights. If you give people the choice of writing good code or fast code, there's something wrong. Good code should be fast. At Bell Labs, Stostrup developed C++, an object-oriented programming language that made abstraction techniques affordable and scalable. In uh, October 85, we had a commercial release, which was known as the uh, brown bag release uh, because it was so cheap um, and because it has been so economical building it. I wrote 98% of everything there documentation, build procedures, testing, language, the works. C++ revolutionized the industry, and after three decades, it's still the language of choice for a long list of users. C++ uh, survives for this kind of stuff because there are things like the, the video cards and the uh, uh, graphics, the networking software, all of this kind of stuff that's at the bottom of every system has to be efficient. And is there a solution that can help a broader spectrum or, or a larger uh, group of people, larger set of problems, larger uh, time scale? Um, but we have to find the problem first that's worth solving and find the constraints on the solution to the problem. After that, we have pretty good ways of, of, of engineering a solution. My advisor was a fellow, and his advisor was a fellow. Being recognized to be part of all of this is, 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 is very, very exciting for me, and I'm very honored. Tonight we honor Bjarne Sjöstrup and present, sorry, the 2015 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Bjarne Sjöstrup tonight for his invention of the C++ programming language. Please join me in welcoming Bjarne to the stage. I am. Um... I had some prepared words, but they've stolen all of my best lines, both in the introduction and the uh, movie, so I can't do that. So f first, um, I'll, I'll thank you for coming. Um, I could give a long list of people I really should thank, but I'll just pick a few because otherwise you'll get very bored. Um, it's, 
It's really great to have been part of what has been going on. I mean, C++ is an industrial language. This is an industrial um, organization, basically. Um, and be, being honored for, for having contributed is great. I mean, C++ has been at sort of just about every major thing in a lot of industries, the computer industry, the semiconductor industry, uh, well, Hollywood, um, the uh, aerospace industry, the telecommunications industry where it came from and grew up, uh, graphics, movies, uh, ships, engines, you name it. So it's been really fun. A another thing that, that has been fun and I'm very actually proud of for having made a tiny little contribution to science uh, because C++ has been part of some of the most interesting uh, endeavors that we've seen. It's on Mars and the rovers. It's at the bottom of the oceans in, in various forms. Um, somebody used string matching in C++ in the Human Genome Project. And um, when, when CERN finally found the um, top, uh, no, the, um, yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's uh, hard to stand up here and improvise. Uh, I got a one letter message from one of their main teams it says, thank you. So I've done this little bit. This is great. Uh, it's great to have been part of. And another reason I like being here is that actually I have been interested in history for a long, long time. Um, I was thinking of becoming a historian and decided that history was a great hobby and a lousy career. Uh, whereas mathematics, as I thought computer science was, was a great career and a lousy hobby because you have to do it full time. And so I, I really think people should know more about where their ideas and their techniques and their science comes from. We, we need people not to be ahistorical as we generally are in computers. Uh, even the academics tend not to know their the, the, the ancestry. And certainly in industry, people don't know what come from. So really, really support your library, uh, your, your museum, uh, support its uh, growth, support its outreach, and be sure that you don't just do hardware. I was down seeing the exhibit. It was wonderful. I programmed a lot of those computers. But there's a little sort of appendix, a dark room over on the corner called software. <laughs> and without software, all of these things are boat anchors. OK. I, I, I think I should tell you a little bit how this came about. Um, I found myself at Bell Labs. Uh, trying to figure out uh, what to do, and I decided I was going to split the Unix kernel. I was going to build something where parts of programs could run in different parts of a machine, be it a multiprocessor or a distributed systems with a, um, with a network in between. And if I had done that, we would have seen Unix clusters or Unix multiprocessors many years earlier. But I found I couldn't build it. The language in which to write that didn't exist. There was no language around that could do the low level stuff really well and do the abstraction getting away from the hardware really well. Uh, low level stuff like memory management, uh, process scheduling, network drivers, high level stuff just simply saying these two parts are separate and they communicate in this particular way. But such things existed. You could look at C and a lot of other uh, languages that was machine close. Uh, or you, and you could look at Simula that had the abstraction features. So I took the two things and put them together. And I learned a lot about C from Dennis Ritchie and Brian Koenig and the others at Bell Labs. And I, I thank them. Otherwise, I, I couldn't have done this. Similarly, I'd actually learned object-oriented programming and sim Simula from Chris Nugor, and uh, so I was lucky in where I was. And one thing that struck me is that uh, these people I mentioned are not just great scientists, uh, famous, this, that, and other. They were all real gentlemen, really nice people. They had the time, 
and they were willing to, to spend it with, with some novice that was trying to, to catch up. And so, um, I think I'll just stop here and say thank you. Thank you to uh, all the people that's helped along. Thanks to all the people that's helped build those wonderful C++ applications. Thanks to the people who's helped in the standards effort to keep it stable. Stability is a feature, especially when you build uh, infrastructure that has to last for decades. Uh, and a lot of the people who's helped with new ideas, great ideas. So thank you very much. Garnet, don't worry, there's a 6,000 square foot gallery being built downstairs that will be called Make Software Change the World. And that little, that little appendix is going to become a mighty gallery any day now, I, I guarantee you. So final thing I love about our fellows, they always, every year, they say, it was small, I was lucky, I had no tools, it was a team, I made a lot of mistakes. The humility that we hear every single year is so inspiring and the impact is so enormous. And you've done it again this year. Bjarne, Evelyn, Shandini, please give your father our best. It's been a wonderful night. Thank you very much. All right, now the induction ceremony is finished and I invite you all to the after party, which is in the grand hall across the way for coffee and cordials and dessert and music. Enjoy each other, say hello to the fellows, and let the wonderful night continue. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.